Welcome to the Nuclear Snail channel. I've just finished building what I believe to be the sickest prop that I've made so far. This took a lot of time and effort and I will tell you about my design process and of course show all of its glorious features. But before we do that, I got two important disclaimers. Number one, dear YouTube moderators, as I've just stated, this is a prop. It doesn't shoot anything. It was never my intention to make it shoot anything, so it doesn't. The only reason for this thing's existence is so it looks cool. And I think it looks mighty cool. And in this video I will be uh, showing some uh, features of it as well as how I've built it. And that has nothing to do with how a firearm works, for example. Because again, this thing looks scary, but it's just a prop. Number two. To my viewers, those of you who want to build their own props, which look like weapons, before you do, consider whether or not it is legal for you to do so, because sometimes it is not in some places, or maybe some places plus age combination or whatever. So before you build something like this, even if it doesn't shoot anything, check that it is legal to do for you. And if it is legal for you to build, then also consider in which situations, locations, and so on and so forth, it is both legal and smart to display such a thing. Because a lot of people can get scared if you tote around something that looks like a weapon. So be very considerate with this kind of thing, or you might find yourself in trouble with the police. So, uh, moving on to the fun parts of the video. So, what was my challenge here, my self-imposed challenge? Those were multiple. Number one is, I wanted to create something that I built completely from scratch. Meaning sheet metal, uh, sheet plastic, chunks of wood, chunks of plywood, a piece of aluminum pipe, a piece of polycarbonate, and, well, okay, there is a lens from a camcorder here, as well as on the back. And also those bolts are not built by me, because, come on, I also didn't mine my raw materials to create the aluminum sheets, but you get the idea. Basically, one of my challenges was no wrist rails, no existing scopes, no nothing except, you know, basic forms like tube or square tube. There is one on the inside holding these two parts together because this can be broken down into parts, I will show it to you later, so that it fits into my costume crate easily. Um, and so on and so forth. So basically raw materials. There is, as you can probably tell, a lot of CNC work done on this. Uh, technically something like this can be built without using CNC, but it's just a ton easier with an access to a CNC. So anyway, that was my first challenge. Uh, also not replicating something like a wrist rail. So neither design a replication nor taking ready-made parts but using raw materials. Challenge number two was, well, this is basically my take on a Gauss rifle. A retro-futuristic Gauss rifle, to be more specific. Um, and the idea was to create something that looks even more specifically like a late-stage prototype or first mini-series production that would have been uh, made in the 50s or 60s in an alternate universe where Gauss rifle technology was available at that time. So what we're talking about here, the general, the very general style, is called retrofuturism, where you have some uh, retro-looking things, so retro style, combined with a futuristic concept. Although here it's technically retrofuturism combined with, let's say, hyper-modernism, if you will, because, for example, this pattern right here, it's very modern, so is this, and the whole idea of a hexagonal shape, well, it, I wouldn't say it's exactly modern, but it's used in modern designs a lot, although there are even some um, cowboy rifles from like 1800-somethings that have a hexagonal barrel or a octagonal barrel, um, just not as thick as this. 
so it's not really the same thing because this is more of a let's call it barrel shroud. Now for those of you who don't know a ghost rifle also known as electromagnetic coil rifle is a futuristic idea um, of a rifle that is technically not a rifle let's say a projectile accelerator that uses magnetic coils that accelerate a magnetic projectile. Uh, I won't go into more detail uh, about this because the concept should be fairly known to all of you who are into science fiction and post-apocalyptic stuff and if you don't know what a Gauss rifle is, well then there are some other resources that will explain the basics. But um, why I mention that part is because in a lot of depictions of Gauss rifles, in video games especially, you a lot of times see open copper coils <laughs> in the barrel. And it does follow the principle that I always toot my horn about, um, which is wear your stories openly. So if you have a costume and you wear the story uh, or the object that suggests a story or represents a story openly, uh, then it's usually a better costume design, that it's easier readable, and of course the same thing applies to props. So I do not hate the Gauss rifles that show the coils, the electromagnetic coils. However, I wanted to make something that is just a step more realistic. And I'm saying just a step more realistic instead of completely realistic. Um, I will get in a sec to why. But first let's uh, discuss why this is a more realistic design for a Gauss rifle than what you usually see. Uh, and when I say more realistic, I don't say necessarily better. It's not the same thing. Realism is not the same thing as overall quality, okay? So both approaches are, are legit. It's just a lower fantasy, more realistic version. It doesn't mean it's better, it just means it's better for my personal taste. So the main thing is, if you have electromagnetic coils that are completely open, like in a lot of computer games, of course you will get issues. If it rains, you get a short circuit. If you prop up your ghost rifle on something that is conductive, you get a short circuit. If some spit or blood or whatever other fluid flies onto it, you get a short circuit. You scrape your coils uh, and damage them when just moving around. So it's very unrealistic. I wanted to have a barrel shroud for that reason. And this is what you can see here. This is this main beautiful hexagonal part. Now we, we are getting to the part where uh, I say, I said more realistic, not completely realistic. In my design uh, process in Blender, I've toyed with some uh, barrel shroud ideas that would be just a big tube. And I think that would be the most realistic. But just on the meta layer of me being a prop maker, um, a meta layer meaning, well, cognitive meta layer, where people know and I know that I'm a prop maker, just taking a tube for the barrel and calling it a day, it would be more realistic, but it will be like, yeah, okay, he just took a tube for his prop, where's the intricate, beautiful work in that? So I've decided to go for something like this, which was a ton more difficult to make. I do like this aggressive look, th this angular aggressive look that this hexagonal uh, shape gives me. And as you see, it flows through the barrel uh, shroud and through the receiver and terminates in this thick battery here, which is basically just an aluminum tube. I'll get to that in a sec. It's hollow inside and I can store tactical snacks in this. Let's just go from butt to tip and I will just show you the features in more detail and talk about why and how and so on. So first of all, let's check out this buttstock right here. And as you can see, the whole butt part as well as the grip, so this whole part and it goes back here, so it's basically inside of that as well, so this wooden part, it's a sandwich. In the middle there is a thick four millimeter piece of aluminum and it's sandwiched by two um, plywood pieces. So this plywood right here, it is a beach and so is this front right here, although this, this is not from plywood, this is from a solid block. 
So it was a block that is as thick as in the back here. And then I've just sewn it off. And you will also see here that I've uh, created an angle here so it's easier to grip like this. And it works uh, decently well. To be honest, just gripping this <laughs> feels more comfortable. It's just a great, thick, big, natural bunch of cornered profile here, if you will. But this also feels nice, so it's cool. As far as forearms go, I specifically didn't want a foregrip because that would look too modern for my taste. And I wanted to have more of a old school battle rifle and generally more old school vibe to this. So I've jumped now instead of saying, uh, staying at the butt, uh, but then we have already talked about this part. It's held in place by three thick bolts that connect it to the main assembly. Let's get back to the butt here. So uh, the way I've worked on this wood is applying varnish. And it's a special kind of varnish. Um, actually, I don't know if varnish is exactly the right word for it. Anyway, it's either varnish or similar that darkens the wood because original beech wood is a lot lighter. So I applied like three or four or even five layers of uh, varnish to this. And that varnish also has the quality that it protects it from uh, rotting too quickly. At least the specific one that I've got. I'm not that great at woodworking. It's just something that I've uh, <laughs> stole from grandma uh, because she had some of it lying around and it looked cool uh, on the things she applied it to. So I was like, can I have a bit of that? She's like, yes, sure, darling. And now I have a bit of that and I use it on wood. I also used it on my Warhammer, by the way. It's the same thing. So this is how it works. Uh, in the bottom here, these parts uh, are glued together with just some uh, cyanoacrylate glue. Uh, so in between the aluminum plate and this piece of wood, aluminum plate and that piece of wood, because I didn't want to add any bolts here, not to ruin the aesthetic. And on the top right here, you can see it's basically a sandwich. Those uh, metallic frame parts are connected with the rest of the whole thing just with some three millimeter bolts. This right here, it holds the battery in place. It can be uh, easily removed. I originally wanted it to be a pin, but I just couldn't be asked towards the end of the project. Um, and I've just left it a bolt. Um, the idea behind this is that this battery, and those of you who know a bit about electricity will be able to tell just how powerful this battery is supposed to be. It's about as powerful and as large capacity as one found in a modern heavy electric car, just with the ability to uh, give away that energy a lot faster. Um, basically, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but possibly even eliminating the need for capacitors. E either way, it's a huge science fiction battery, okay? And the idea behind it is that uh, either with a pin or even with a bolt and an Allen head, uh, so it's an Allen head bolt and a regular nut on this side, even with this, you would just swap it out every couple of thousand shots rather than like it would be the case with the magazine. So I just imagine this being a very, very big battery. And I also designed it in such a way that it's, uh, if you check it out here, i to be careful not to break my window with the barrel. Um, it says cornucopia small horn. <laughs> and that is the small horn. Imagine the cornucopia gigantic horn. It would be probably something that powers an entire building for half a year or something like that. So in the science fiction world of this, this big battery, um, would be something quite universal actually, maybe not even specifically designed for those rifles, but rather something that just exists in the world. And either that country that develops the um, rifle, I would imagine Eugene Stoner in the United States. Um, of course, later iterations of this would be a lot more elegant, but first prototypes might look orcish as this and super overbuilt. Uh, or the faction in the post-apocalyptic universe would just have access to those batteries and they would uh, build the rifle to accept 
those batteries, rather than in reinventing the battery. And uh, yeah, the cage around it, uh, it's basically just for looks. It's to counterbalance the massive, massive appearance of the whole front assembly uh, and to also introduce some visual breaks here, some visual rhythm. Um, it would have also looked cool without the cage, I think, but with the cage it's just more harmonic overall, also color-wise. Um, it was a huge pain in the ass to build this battery. Um, well, not to build it. Building it is was more like a tube and then I also just got, you know, the front and the back uh, inserts that make it possible to plop it in. It, it slides on and off, by the way. I will show to you in a sec. But painting this was a pain in the ass until I just found the right colors. And uh, then on top of that, as you see, I've added some washes that make it look like some maybe some spilled acid or what rust or whatever else. I didn't really think much about what specifically it would be, just that it looks a bit more old and messed up. Now just give me a second and I will unscrew this bolt that holds it in the back and we will plop it out and take a look inside. So I have removed the nut here, it was quite easy, and now I just remove this bolt and put it here. And then what I can do, and hopefully I don't let it fall, so there is a slot back here and a double slot here, you will see in a second a bit better. There is still a bit of tension there so it doesn't wobble around. So as you can see here, on the back of this battery we have this protrusion and this hole is where the bolt goes in and then gets locked in place in this slot that exists back here. And on the front we see that there are two grooves right here into which these slide in. Now in those two small black holes right here and right here as well as sorry bump the camera here as well as here and here I could ideally also put in some copper looking pieces of metal to indicate the context of this whole thing because those rails it's just to hold it in place it's not supposed to be the context I just didn't get around to it uh, because honestly how often will I ever remove the battery to begin with usually it's just gonna be you know just the whole thing shown but it is possible to remove the battery and uh, let me put this down for a sec this also looks kind of cool by the way now it looks like it, it could be like some sort of a compact uh, stock design although it, it lacks a cheek well but anyway um, and here is the battery so this cage sits around this pipe and if I pull with a bit of force on this, wait, let me get some pliers. If I grab this and pull, ah, you can see inside there is nothing. So the two stripes you see are these, viewed from the back. And this is, as I've said, a perfect compartment to put in some tactical snacks so it can be like recharging. And then I do all of those operations for like a minute or two and then I'm like plop and then I get a, a protein bar out of it and my day becomes better. So now it's important to put this in exactly the way it was and not the wrong way around because it so happens this hole is not exactly in the middle because I messed up a bit. So now I put the battery back into this by sliding it down. I'm propping it up on my knee, by the way, staying, standing on one foot right now. And the battery is back in. As you might see, at least the ones of you with the keener eye, it is not exactly straight. So I will put a spacer at some point between this and this, so that when it... Because here it's fixed on the back, right? But when it slides down here, it can create a bit of a wrong angle which just triggers me so we'll create a spacer here now yes it could also slide up a bit but I'll just have to deal with that <laughs> it doesn't slide out easily okay so what we have here is a 
Well, I don't want to say it is, but rather it represents a cross-trigger safety. So on this side, that would be the safe. And this, with a little bit of red paint here and this nice te texture that I've uh, cut in with a saw for more grip, that represents the fire position. I say it represents a cross trigger safety because the trigger itself is just wedged in there, like there is a um, cross bolt pin, whatever, hidden. So it's it sits in the wood and in the trigger, so the trigger can pivot around that, and the pressure on the trigger makes it so it doesn't move around on its own. But for different situations, for different photos, I can go like, Ugh! so like I'm giving a shot right now and squeeze it, or for other situations, I might go like this, where it's displayed, that it's not depressed. Originally, I wanted to have it uh, be spring-loaded, but I just deemed it unnecessary, and I had to draw the line in the sand at some point for this because honestly this has more uh, features than it really needs for 99% of use cases it will ever see. Uh, moving on to the next, well let's stay with the controls. This is supposed again to represent a magazine release. Um, originally I wanted to have it so that I press the button and then I can remove the magazine but um, Instead, I've uh, gone a shorter route, so I think it would be viable to build something like this. Uh, not even that difficult, but it would be just much more work. And again, how often will I be removing the magazine on this? This pin comes out on the other side. The pin is... Uh, I drilled through it, and um, here is a small... Well, whatever that is called, that prevents it from sliding out. So give me a sec, I'll remove that and show you how the magazine comes out and what it looks like. So here is this small metallic, well, cross pin, I guess, for the pin. And since I have removed it on this side, I can now, on this side, pull this out. Now, like, realistically, on a real gauze rifle, quote-unquote, um, I would be pressing this button in and it would go in by the amount of distance found here between the button and the body but as is on the prop I pull this out and now I can remove the magazine which as you can see cannot feed anything because it's not a magazine <laughs> it just looks like one because Again, I could have done uh, a lot more details even than I already have, but let's be honest, how often will this happen? I might have another mags uh, like stuck in with this end invisible on my costume, so imagine like one, two, three more mags here and one in here if I ever get to build them. And at some point I want to build a whole gauze sniper costume, but I'm not there yet. So this right here is a big box made out of thick, thick aluminum pieces. Give me a sec to adjust the zoom. Here we go. So as you can see by this seam right here, those aluminum pieces that form the frame of this are super thick. The whole thing is very overbuilt. And this is where I come in and say, hey, this definitely looks like a prototype, possibly a late stage prototype, but definitely prototype, not a production ready model in any sort of a uh, country even in alternate history but either it's a prototype in an alternate history setting or it's just the way they build it in a post-apocalyptic faction that just can't be asked to optimize and on the bottom you can see those are grippy grippy uh, thingy thingies that are painted red I imagine that different sorts of ammunition could go into a gauss rifle because it will accelerate whatever is magnetic so different sorts of ammunition could be used and the red color represents the type that is loaded in right now. Um, I chose red specifically so it can give complementary contrast to the battery because uh, I also like uh, red or yellow highlights so when I do other magazines I will have like red, I will have 
yellow, I will have blue, I will have pink, I will have green, I will have possibly all kinds of rainbow colors to represent the different sorts of ammunition a Gauss rifle could take, which I think is a fascinating idea. Um, you can see here on the side, this is like 1.5 millimeter polycarbonate, which is a tough uh, plastic that is also transparent. And inside there are some steel tubes from the construction store, so those are not rods. The whole thing weighs enough already as it is, so I've decided to go with hollow tubes, but you don't see it here because you cannot really look into them. But you still can see them, which would both be a uh, desirable feature on a magazine, uh, so you can just look at it and go like, okay, I have, I don't have, this is how many I possibly have, at least you can estimate it. And um, also it, of course, adds to the overall prop uh, look and perceived build quality because, well, it's just more detail and it just uh, drives it more towards saying, hey, there is like this magazine looking thing with those uh, rod looking things. Well, then possibly this is what's getting shot rather than this being just, for example, a laser or plasma rifle. We, if you imagine the magwell being gone, like this, just like that, this could be a viable retrofuturistic laser or plasma rifle design, right? But by adding the mag, well, of course, for laser, you imagine like this is gone. This is like, there is just more grip or whatever. Uh, but for, for this, as soon as I add this, anyone educated enough will be able to tell, hey, this is probably the ammunition and oh this it says something about volts and watts and kilowatt hours and it has uh, like this mechanics and lightning symbol in it probably that's a battery so that's how i tell a story um i also of course continue telling the story by the means of this barrel being thick enough to theoretically fit some electromagnetic coils. But we will get to that in a sec. Let me put in back the pin that secures the magazine. And by the way, it is secured in here by this small, small cutout. There is actually two of them back here because I messed it up the first time. There, is, there are two small cutouts and those are just big enough so that when this ridge right here, this ridge goes in there. You can see here is a slot. Wait a sec, let me zoom in. So here is the slot into which the ridge goes and there is that hole. And if I now put in this bolt, putting it now from the wrong side, but you can see it there. So that cutout in the magazine ridge gets caught. Now, they do not do actual magazines on actual firearms or any other weapons like this, because again, it's super over overbuilt. It's not economic to make, so uh, they do it a different way. And in there, you can see the central uh, metal rod that connects the front and the rear halves of this, because this can be broken down into two parts. Uh, well, technically more parts if you count detaching the magazine uh, the and the battery. Um, but this breaks down into two parts, each of them 60 centimeters long, which allows me to just put it into my uh, costume crate. Uh, on which, by the way, for security reasons, if I have something that looks like a weapon in there, I will always put an additional lock. So let me put back in the magazine. And this fits really nice and tight, a bit too tight actually. <laughs> like if it was a real thing, the soldiers using it would be really complaining a lot. Uh, not just about this, but about a lot of things about this whole thing. Ah, oh, that clacked, clacked so nicely. Let me do it again without talking, just for you. Ah. Anyway, a lot about this looks cool, but is super not ergonomic. <laughs> but again, if we're talking first prototype or just a post-apocalyptic production, then it's fine. Let's see if I can put this in while on camera. Uh, this pin right here. Then I just use some pliers to push it in. There we go. And then I just bend it a bit. 
Like again, before you say, why didn't you use like some pins from an airsoft gun or whatever? No, because I wanted to build this thing from scratch. That's why. Um, now that, that we're flipped around, let's look at this side. We have a dial here going from minus to plus. This, I wanted to be able to rotate this originally. I technically could, but I will refrain from doing so because the bolt holding it in place, it's going straight through the aluminum and right into the wood. So it just doesn't have an infinite amount of durability to it. And honestly, uh, since it's not a really great designed dial, it doesn't really tell you where on the range you are right now. It would be something that the operator of this would just learn to know and use. And I think it's a very interesting idea uh, that in a Gauss rifle, you could do two different things essentially. Well, this is supposed to be a fluid dial with, you know, no steps. So you can go either minimum or maximum or any step in between. But the two interesting um, lines or two interesting limits to cross or not cross, actually it's just one limit to cross or not cross, for a Gauss rifle would be that either you go full power and it just flies with a lot of speed, but then it causes a supersonic crack, so it's loud. Because objects uh, just moving fast causes supersonic crack, even without any gunpowder being involved or whatever. So the weapon doesn't really make boom, but the projectile does as it flies. But then you have a lot of power, but a supersonic crack. So Gauss rifles going just like boom, that... I don't want to say it's unrealistic, but they're usually displayed <laughs> just exploding some alien into pieces or whatever uh, through the alien power armor and whatnot. And that is not realistic because for that to happen, you need to move a lot faster with supersonic speeds where you would definitely also hear a supersonic crack. Uh, another setting would be to go subsonic where the crack doesn't happen. For example, if you shoot uh, a bolt from a crossbow it is definitely not going supersonic at least not yet uh, so uh, there is no supersonic crack it's quiet and especially in a post-apocalyptic world uh, there would be multiple uses for that sneaky missions or just hunting game because you don't want to scare away the game by giving away your direction of course it might get scared regardless but it's better to be as quiet as possible and also just being able to regulate your, uh, sorry, wrong side, your power uh, for other situations where you don't require the full power might be an interesting feature. So I've included it here by providing this dial. The way I did this is CNC engraving and CNC cutting out a circle and then these uh, side cuts I did with a file, just a manual file. Um, moving on to this side again just because it's more comfortable for me to hold it and uh, a lot of things except some of the controls are um, on both sides identical so um, let's move on to this now you can see right here that there are two guards so that the accidental uh, movement of this doesn't happen. What is this, you might ask? Those of you who are into firearms might have been looking at this the whole time and go like, why is there an ejection port on a Gauss rifle? There is no shell to eject. Well, this would not be an ejection port. It would be a port, all right, but more like a debugging port. Because no matter what it is, if there is a magazine that's supposed to be feeding bullets or rods or shells or whatever into a barrel-ish thing, which would also be happening on a futuristic rifle, I presume, uh, some misfeeds or double feeds or mistakes or whatever might happen. And in that case, it would be a good idea to give the operator the ability to quickly debug it, or at least relatively quickly. Now, the idea behind this is you can use a finger to slide it back, of course, this whole thing is under more tension than would allow this right now. So I would need to use a tool to pull it back. It's not a great design. It would definitely be something that the soldiers uh, would complain about and that would get fixed in a later 
iteration of this. But again, this is supposed to be a prototype, so some things um, are not supposed to be perfect about this. I just like the way it looks. I wanted to add some uh, detail up here to compensate for the huge amount of detail on the barrel, especially this intricate pattern here, uh, so this doesn't look too empty. And also, I think it is realistic. Also, this port is on both sides, by the way. I think it is realistic. Um, to have such a thing in general, because again, it would be familiar to soldiers transitioning from a traditional firearm to a futuristic Gauss rifle to have the same location where they can grab and debug, remove the double feed or stuck Gauss projectile or whatever. So I think this is another realistic feature I have added. And I could show you how this opens, it actually does but I will not right now because I don't want to scratch up the paint of this just for aesthetic reasons. Realistically, this would be uh, more scratched up than it is right now and or this whole thing would be just better built to allow for f more frictionless movement. Um, but this is another st extra step I didn't take. Uh, notice that here there is some sort of a number on this scope. Uh, I've added this to visually counterbalance this, this, and this, and basically draw a lot of visual fine detail into the center of this. There is also this decal on the top of the scope. Looks almost cyberpunk to me, really. Uh, what I imagine this would be, if this would be coupled with some surveillance drone technology or something else like this, then you could like just take your drone, scan this so it's connected to the scope, and then send it out to scout targets or whatever else. Uh, this would be the functional explanation of this, the purely visual aesthetic explanation of this, which is why I did it in the first place. You can see that if you look at it like this, it counterbalances the red that appears here, which I think creates a nice highlight and also a nice echo. So the white here counterbalances this, and the red here counterbalances this. Um, since we are at the scope right now, let's talk about that for a brief amount of time. So on the side, we can see that there is an Allen wrench looking thing here, which is like how modern scopes also have their uh, windage adjustment. So that would be side to side and that would be, sorry, this would be side to side and this was, put, no, sorry, the other way around. Either way, one of them is side to side and other is up and down. Um, on the other side of the scope, we can see something that I imagine to be more uh, or less brightness and also changing the reticle and or turning the whole thing on and off. There is no separate battery compartment because I imagine in a system like this, you would definitely have some sort of a low voltage system inside for computers that uses a what it's called a transformer. I'm not that much, much into electric st stuff, but something that steps down the current and the voltage from this um, humongous battery that uh, creates a low voltage system for the computers needed to run a gas rifle to run it. Uh, and that would also have a branch, a, a wire, something to power the scope. Depending on how advanced such a system would be, uh, there, there would also possibly be, there would also possibly be some sort of a way to measure how much the specific projectile weighs and uh, to adjust the sco scope accordingly to the projectile weight, to the selected uh, intensity or power, and to the distance that the scope measures. Or maybe it's a lower tech solution where none of this happens, but the scope is still just powered from within. Because, again, you have a power source already. Talking about scope and aiming, uh, some of you might say, but what about co-witness sights? What about like iron sights in general? What if your scope fails? For visual design reasons, I didn't want any iron sights on this. Originally, I imagined it just with iron sights, but then it was like, come on, a high-tech DMR weapon uh, that calls for a scope. I wanted to have a bigger scope, but that would prove problematic due to how the whole thing is constructed. Um, 
and how this whole thing works when I want to break it down for transport. Uh, because these bolts right here that hold the whole scope assembly in place, they also go all the way down here and connect uh, into the main core of this, into the main metal piece that uh, goes through the whole barrel assembly. And the, uh, I, you will see in a sec. Basically, these bolts need, they are long and they need to come up and in all the way and the bigger scope would be just a pain in the ass to assemble and reassemble possible, but a pain in the ass. So I settled on this sort of a scope. Ow, <laughs> I just slugged myself in the chin here. Be careful when handling your props. I just wanted to scratch myself or something and did this. Be careful. What I imagined this scope to be would be some sort of a uh, two X or maybe like one to four X variable red dot kind of an optic. Uh, as I've said, the lenses here are from an old camcorder. Uh, a fun fact is that when looking through this, what happens to the picture is it's flipped upside down and zoomed out, kind of like a fish eye. So in practical terms, it's completely useless, but again, it looks cool, and that's all that I wanted with this. And that's also built really sturdy, so you can even grab it like this and shake it around a bit. <laughs> Not much happens. The whole thing weighs about like 5 kilograms or 10 pounds, by the way, give or take. So it's not light. Okay, um, moving on away from the scope to this. It's just a visual decal. Uh, this is not how a serial number of any sort would be implemented because, as you can see, this is easy to remove. Uh, it's just, you know, a designation of what it is. And what it's supposed to be saying in my mind is EM stands for electromagnetic designated marksman rifle model one. Although this is technically again kind of a prototype, but maybe they assign model one to it in that fictional world. And maybe it just continued being manufactured like this by some technologically advanced faction uh, to the amounts of a couple of a dozen or maybe a couple of hundreds maybe. I imagine this to be something that a rich adventurer would be able to uh, get made to order rather than something that is manufactured serially in any sort of a post-apocalyptic world. Okay, um, let us move on to the front of the rifle. We talked about this grip already, so this is nice. You, you will notice that here is sort of a sling loop and it's also on the other side and it has this wide five centimeter slot in there to just put a belt through and also those small holes right here you can see it better like this there is a hole and there is a hole and there is the slot in the middle so the, it's the same on the opposite side and we also have another one here it's exactly the same so these are really built in there. And on the back, we have this, which also is kind of wedged together and held by this bolt and it's sandwiched in there. So it's like really a rather integral part of the whole thing. It's, oh yeah, it's pretty immovable here. So I like that. Lots of options for attachment and I mean, if we're talking post-apocalypse, you could sling all sorts of straps around this because this offers this nice large shaft thing here. By the way, let's get back to this for a sec. Now, this is not very comfortable. Like, just for practicality, this is not very good, but it looks cool. And I'm talking about this part specifically. And what it allows me to do is also this, which I think is a really cool pose, looks really nice so yeah but again this was just mostly for aesthetics so I have a bit more wood and a bit more of this old-school kind of sporting or m marksman sniper rifle ish looking vibe to it okay let's get back to the front here so here is our barrel, sh b barrel shroud and you will notice, by the way, that there is this thick aluminum rail on top here. It ends about here, but then continues with an identical rail that goes all the way to the front. 
it's echoed on the bottom by this, so it's like rather a symmetric design if you look at it from the front. We'll get to that in a sec, but let's stay with this. So uh, there are some hexagonal spacers on the inside into which these bolts go. So there is like cross thick spacers that are aligned like, like, like this and it goes on and on like here, here, here and here. And these panels are then bolted in designated spots to those spacers forming this hexagonal shroud. I really like this. On the one hand it looks really modern and tactical and science fiction-ish. On the other hand it's even reminiscent of some sort of a Viking uh, decoration or some sort of a tribal decoration in some way. You know, just triangles, just a basic form doing its thing. I like it. And here on the front I've considered uh, adding some protrusions at first, like some additional technological stuff that just plops out of the front of the barrel. But then I decided to go just simple and add these five slots. What was clear to me is that something needs to happen at the front so it doesn't look too empty. So it balances out all the other detail that's going on in the whole thing, so it's visually balanced out. Let's get to the front. The front of it is important. And there is this thick, thick aluminum piece at the front, at the very end, making it look very solid. And there is another piece on top of that that is bolted uh, to make it look uh, such a way that if you were to remove these bolts, you could possibly like start disassembling the whole thing, I guess, that there is like some sort of a another core to the whole idea. In reality there's really not. Uh, and these slots in an X pattern just reinforce where the center of the barrel is. In there uh, you can see on the inside I messed it up a bit. There is some, uh, some artifacts, some holes on the inside of the barrel, but seriously who is gonna ever look at that or photograph that. Uh, this tube in the middle it goes just about like a couple of centimeters in, but that is enough to create the darkness that is necessary. And at the very back of it, you cannot see it right now, but that's good. <laughs> uh, there is like just a piece of black foam, EVA foam, uh, that, that de uh, serves as a backdrop so that nothing shines in there or reflects back at you because it's not a very long tube. It's just like a really short one but I wanted it to look as if it's really long and dark. So, let's get back to this part for a sec. You can possibly see in here, come on camera, do the job. You can see that here is some sort of a old school looking uh, grained textured plastic in there. And that is to represent that this outside shroud is just for more structural integrity. Well, on the inside there is a plastic, um, some sort of a plastic encased, oh there it is, there's the grain. Some sort of a plastic encased uh, assembly with the plastic being weaker than the aluminum here, but providing some sort of uh, electrical as well as uh, water insulation because the last thing you would ever want, as I mentioned before, is conductive fluids anywhere near your high, high, high voltage magnetic coils because that would short circuit it, it could kill you and so on and so forth. Electricity and water is usually a bad idea. So. That was my idea behind introducing plastic behind this and also just from a design standpoint uh, just this interplay between a lot of metal, some wood and a little bit of plastic I think is just the right combination for the time and technological period that I'm going for and combining different materials and right amounts can be beautiful. Okay, uh, so we went but to tip, one feature I want to show you before I finish this video this time, 
because otherwise it will be going on forever, is how this thing uh, breaks in two for easy transport, which is important because it's a freaking meter long and just transporting this in a separate bag is it's a hassle. It, it is nice if you are able to put your props in the same bag as the rest of your costume. So I will grab this really big Allen wrench right here. Well, it's really long and I will start disassembling this. So what I'm doing is this bolt as well as this bolt. This, now I can by the way remove the scope assembly. You can see these two bolts right here hold these two pieces together as well as the bottom of the scope. It's all attached in one segment. So here it is. If I ever wanted to reuse it for another project, I could. And now we remove this bolt and check this out. Voila! So, this is the front, this is the back. So let me show you the front first. You can see that this is an aluminum uh, pipe, a square aluminum pipe. It is square to prevent rotation and so it's easier to drill into. Here are some holes and I've also filled it out with some um, aluminum sheets so uh, and epoxy so that it forms sort of a solid-ish thing into which I could uh, cut some... Uh, I could tap it to create some thread inside of this hole. And there is also another hole you can see from above. So this is where the bolt comes in. Here are the parts of the back assembly. And then there is another hole in which there is some threading. And here there is some uh, EVA foam to look like it's forming a hermetic seal where water can't get in. Um, it of course can, because it's not perfect, but also to even out some imbalances because I made some mistakes, so not each one of those um, barrel shroud plates was exactly the same length. So I've just compensated it by adding this. And you can see down here is an additional kind of a pin looking thing. And now let's take the other side of this. That's the back part and that pin goes right into that hole additionally to prevent rotation although not a lot of that is happening because of the square nature of this whole thing and you see this whole thing it's glued with epoxy out of multiple pieces of aluminum it has a cut out in here and there is this hole right here I hope you can see it where the bolt goes in and then it goes well, let me show you goes like like this so it will go through both this and the metallic uh, square rod of the front assembly uh, which by the way all by itself looks like some sort of a uh, I guess futuristic mace kind of thing um, but what is also pretty cool about this construction is not only that I can break it down into two pieces, but this could also receive another sort of barrel if I, if I was to build one using the same sort of uh, attachment system. And then I could, for example, also remove the magazine and replace it with something else and put like a futuristic ray gun looking thing at the front. Or I could keep the magazine and add like a short barrel and then it's like some sort of a short SMG kind of a thing so who knows what I would build in the future but for now I'm just exhausted from this project so guys I know I have not touched on everything you could possibly ask about this whole thing um, I also have like a lot of pictures of work in progress uh, of this and so on and so forth and a lot 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 more thought went into designing and building this but I just figure I could either make some more videos about this project, 
with more specific details about whatever, um, write in the comments. Uh, or I could just move on because honestly, it's already a lot of information about this and it was a gigantic project for me. It was really fun to build. I'm looking forward to making some uh, really cool uh, photos with it. Uh, by the way, if you are a video game company or a movie company or whatever, and you want to license this design from me, or want me to design you some other sort of props, be it uh, weapon props or anything else, or be it concept arts, 3D, uh, whatever for your game series, whatever else, uh, hit me up. I, I am a, a freelance designer of all sorts and a concept artist, so um, I accept jobs to design cool stuff. If you are a regular viewer of this channel, then consider supporting me on Patreon, because that helps me a lot, and I will be very grateful to you, even for a small contribution. Uh, also, there is uh, the link to my Nuclear Snail community group on Facebook, that's linked in the video description. Uh, you can join that and share your works and have a chat with other people that are also into this whole post-apocalyptic props and costumes thing. And uh, guys, uh, if you're interested in buying in some of my gear, the things you see here or here or this, just hit me up. Write me on Facebook or Instagram or email, not in the YouTube comments, because that's a surefire way for me to probably miss it. But if you're interested in buying my gear or having me made a commission for you specifically, then also hit me up. With all of that said, have fun, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!